Hey, welcome back to the Michael Lofton Show. Is Taylor Marshall a modernist? I am going to cover a modernist tactic used by Taylor Marshall and others. And once I point this tactic out, you're probably going to start noticing it very often. It is a tactic condemned by uh, Pope Pius X in his work Lamentably, where he uh, combats the heresy of modernism. But before we dive into that, I want to remind you, hit that subscribe button. Help me grow this channel. If you appreciate reason and theology and the content here and you think that it is something that needs to reach more people, help me do that by hitting that subscribe button and the like button while you're at it. By the way, hit, hit the uh, bell for notifications so you know when I go live. And also, this video is sponsored by realestateforlife.org. If you're looking to buy a home or sell a home, office, property, or anything like that anywhere in the world, and you want to support the pro-life movement at no cost to you in the process, definitely check them out. Realestateforlife.org, 1877 life us one All right. Well, let's go ahead and dive in. I want to share with you a tweet that was recently posted where we see this uh, modernist tactic at play. Um, and so I want to engage the tweet and then show you from Lamentably where this tactic comes from, whether one is aware of it or not. It is a modernist tactic. Um, and again, as I said, you're probably going to start noticing others once I point this out who are doing the same. All right. So if you look here at your screen, you can see this tweet that was just posted by Dr. Marshall is the Synod in October authorize or if the synod in october authorizes women priests what will you do okay so he's putting it out there that somehow the church through the synod may change its position on women priests now of course the issue of women uh to the priesthood is an issue that is dogmatically excluded um, or at the very least, something with ecclesiastical faith that is excluded. We know it's infallibly taught that only men can be ordained to the priesthood, and we can find that in Ordinatio Sacerdotalis by John Paul II. So what he's suggesting here is that it's possible for the church through the synod to go against its own infallible teaching. And he says, if this happens, what will you do? And there was a pretty good response that this individual offers here. And he says, it doesn't have the authority to do so. You should stop pretending it does in order to boost your interactions while dividing the sheep of Christ. Well said, well said. What often happens is people are exploiting others' fears. And somebody else actually pointed out an inconsistency with Marshall here. Because they said this guy literally just did a video praising Pope Francis for putting into canon law that a person who attempts to ordain a woman is automatically excommunicated. And he links the video that Marshall did showing that. And so there's an inconsistency here on part of Marshall because he just did a video not long ago saying Pope Francis puts into canon law excommunication for anyone who attempts to ordain a woman, and yet he wants to entertain the notion that Pope Francis is going to allow for a situation where the church change changes its perspective on women's ordination through the Senate of Bishops. There's an internal inconsistency here, and thus people are rightly calling him out and say, look, this is fear-mongering. You're just playing on people's fears. You're capitalizing on their fears, and there's no good reason for doing this, and ultimately you're undermining the Catholic faith. And it's just a not true because the synod doesn't have that authority. If you look at the Code of Canon Law, Canon 343, the Synod of Bishops does not have the authority to settle any issues of that nature. None. Zero. Absolutely none. So why in the world would somebody actually entertain this perspective? As I pointed out the other day, we actually see radical liberals saying that the church is going to change its position on women's ordination. And yet here we have radical traditionalists saying the exact same thing. Neither one of them seem to actually believe what the church teaches on matters of the magisterium and its indefectibility, that it could not do such a thing. Okay, well, let's actually turn to the tactic. And let's first take a look briefly at the 24th 
proposition that was condemned by Pius X in Lamentabili. Again, he did multiple things to condemn the heresy of modernism. And here he puts forward a whole bunch of propositions that the modernists would uh, endorse, and he condemns them. He says, no, this is wrong. This is modernism. This is condemned. And one of those propositions, the 24th proposition, says, effectively, the exegete who constructs premises from which it follows that dogmas are historically false or doubtful is not to be reproved as long as he does not directly deny the dogmas themselves. So what the modernist was doing, their tactic was to say, look, as long as we don't actually deny the teaching itself, it's okay to put forward premises that will put into doubt the teaching or even contradict the teaching if carried out to its conclusion, as long as we don't deny the teaching itself. Well, the Pope says that is a modernist tactic. That is not okay. That proposition is condemned. And in fact, it is perfectly legitimate for the church to condemn a person who is constructing premises that either deny a doctrine or put it into doubt, even if that person who's constructing it says they don't deny the teaching or the dogma. So again, this is a modernist tactic that we see them using at the turn of the 20th century, and yet here Marshall is doing the exact same. Let me show you how. Marshall is effectively saying, let me bring it back up on the screen so you can see it. Marshall is once again effectively saying that if the Synod approves of women priesthood, which again, it can't per canon 343, but if it does and the church approves of this through the Synod, what would you do? Well, what's, what's the underlying premise there? Well, He's not saying outright, hey, I deny the indefectibility of the church. I deny the protection that the Holy Spirit has for the magisterium and its teaching authority and its for its governing authority. He's not saying I deny those things. So he doesn't actually deny the doctrine, just as the modernists would say, well, I don't actually deny the doctrine, but they will construct a premise that will either lead to a denial of the doctrine or put it into doubt, which in this case, Marshall falls under both. It would both uh, put it into doubt, that is the indefectibility of the church, and actually deny it. Because the indefectibility of the church also pertains to the teaching and governing office of the church. If you look at Pastor Eternus in Vatican I, Pastor Eternus chapter 4, paragraph 6 and 7, you see that the purpose of the papacy is to guard the deposit of faith. And it's pointed out there at Vatican I, if the Pope were to fail in this, then the church would fall into schism and it would effectively falsify its own self. Its own claims that it made about the magisterium would be falsified. The very purpose of the Catholic Church is to present, prevent such a case, to prevent a case where the Pope would then authorize something that is contrary to an infallible teaching. The whole purpose of the papacy is to prevent that. So if that happens, if Pope Francis then approves of women priesthood, which makes no sense because he put in in the canon law that that's a, something that results in excommunication. But if he actually approves of that, we have a problem because that would seem to falsify the claims that Vatican I made about the papacy, even outside of ex-cathedra teachings. Again, read chapter 4, Pastor Eternus, paragraph 6 and 7. It's not about ex-cathedra teachings. It's about the papacy as a whole. It's not going to approve of things that would contradict infallible teachings because that would defeat the whole purpose of the magisterium in guarding the deposit of faith. A Protestant could just come along or an Orthodox could just come along and say, see, your magisterium failed. You claimed that it is going to preserve and guard the deposit of faith, but in fact, it's violated and attacked it. So what's happening here is that Though Marshall is not going to say, I deny the indefectibility of the teaching authority of the church and thus of the church itself. He's not going to say that. But what he is setting up here in the premise is something that leads to that. And most certainly, at the very least, puts it into doubt. It would certainly put into doubt the indefectibility of the church, if not actually deny it, which I would argue for the latter. But at the very least, 
You would just simply need to demonstrate the former, that he's putting it inside out, to demonstrate that this is a modernist tactic. Now, once you become aware of this, start paying attention to what people say. Pay attention. Listen to the things that they say and ask, gee, I wonder if there's a premise at play here that effectively denies the indefectibility of the church or some other infallible teaching. And what you'll see often at play is that person has lost the faith. They don't hold to the faith. They've lost it, and thus you can see in their premises they embrace things that no longer are consistent with the faith, and they'll suggest things like this. What would you do if the Pope taught something ex cathedra that's heretical? Well, wait, why are you asking this question? The premise assumes something that would actually end up denying the indefectibility of the teaching office of the church by asking that question you're revealing that you no longer have the theological virtue of faith. You no longer believe in the indefectibility of the church. And I see it constantly. What will you do if the church allows for um, homosexuality and says it's no longer a sin? A person who asks that question, you have to ask, do you really believe in the indefectibility of the church? Do you really have faith? It sounds to me like you don't, because underlying that premise is a denial of the indefectibility of the church and the protection of the Holy Spirit over the magisterium. There's a denial there. So it very well could be that unless a person is just seriously mistaken and just inconsistent, it very well could be a sign that the person no longer actually believes the Catholic faith in a particular area. They no longer have that virtue, that theological virtue of faith. And what happens then is, they end up aiding the enemies of the church, whether they realize it or not, because by asking these kinds of questions, if the Senate in October authorizes women priests, what will you do? How is that not an argument in favor of Protestantism and Orthodox? It, the Orthodox in Protestants would just come along and say, look, your church now approves of this. Or you think that your church would approve of this. How do you really have confidence in its indefectibility? If your church can do such a thing, why would I ever be in communion with it? And why would I ever believe what your church, church teaches about the papacy and about the indefectibility of the church? And they're rightly going to point out those inconsistencies. And so what takes place here is a person ends up being a great evangelizer for Protestantism and Eastern Orthodoxy, whether they realize it or not. Unfortunately, many Catholics are doing this. It's not just Taylor and Marshall. We're constantly doing this in our premises, and it's a modernist tactic that we need to stop doing when we need to start exercising the theological virtue of faith and say, you know what, I don't believe that that's possible because I do believe that there's a general protection of the Holy Spirit that would not allow the church to go against its infallible teachings in such a way. I hope this was helpful to y'all in pointing this out. I want y'all to start noticing it in others, so please do so. If you want to learn more about the synod on synodality and, and the question of women's ordination, I did a whole video already on this. I recommend that you take a look at it. Go ahead and click on it. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Watch it. I go over the Synod of Bishops extensively in canon law, what it is, what it can and cannot do. And then I consider the question of women's ordination to the priesthood. Is it still open in Catholicism? Sneak peek. Hint. The answer is no. It is infallibly taught that men only can be priests. And you'll see that in Ordinatio Sacerdotalis, where I go over where the Pope taught that infallibly. And you can see that as I walk you through the text. So certainly go and check that out. Also hit that subscribe button. If you're enjoying Reason and Theology, you feel like this is great content that people need to see, I need you to do your part by helping me uh, reach YouTube and its algorithm by reaching more people. And that, and thus what you'll need to do is hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, comment, interact with the video. The more you do that, the more YouTube's algorithm will kick in and reach more people who haven't heard maybe these answers and haven't considered Considered some of these things and perhaps are confused about the upcoming synod of bishops and they think that it's actually possible for the church to change these things and they're really worried well 
they need to be reached with um, some content that will give them some guidance. I certainly attempt to offer that here at Reason and Theology. Help me do that, though, by hitting that subscribe button. Also, check me out, patreon.com forward slash Reason and Theology if you want to support what I'm doing here and get access to extra content. You'll also see a link to the GoFundMe and a PayPal there in the show notes if you want to support me. This is how I provide for my family. A lot of people don't like what I'm saying. They've just canceled me. They don't want to support me. They've unsubscribed. I need your help if you want me to continue to do this as the way that I provide for my family and help others here on YouTube. Well, I need you to do your part. Consider supporting me prayerfully here at Reason and Theology. And if you can't do that financially, at the very least, pray for me and what we're doing here at RT. Okay, I'll see you later. God bless. Are you confused about how Catholic teaching authority works? With encyclicals, papal bulls, councils, and many other things, it's easy to get confused on what is authoritative and what is not. Fortunately, at MaximusInstitute.com, I have prepared a course explaining the magisterium from A to Z. Visit the website and check out the course Understanding the Magisterium for more information. Hey everybody, just wanted to tell you about my new free ebook, Church Chaos, Biblical Insights for Confused Catholics. If you are a confused Catholic and you're thinking about leaving the Catholic Church or you're thinking about converting to the church but you see that there's a crisis in the church and you're just unsure, this is the book for you. Again, it is free. Just simply go to reasonandtheology.com. You'll see a pop-up that comes up on your screen. Just simply click on it and you'll put in your email and it will provide you the free PDF ebook right then and there. Please check it out if you're confused about the situation in the Catholic Church today. Reasonandtheology.com. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button and the subscribe button. See you next time. God bless.